Hi, Gira. Hey, John. So, um, just why did you decide to be an astrophysicist and get into black holes and all that? Um, so that's a good question. Um, let me see. Um, I think since I was probably around the same age you are, I was very interested in space and the universe in general. Um, like, for example, I remember when the internet first started, I remember one of the first things I looked up is, you know, what's the, can you ever break the speed of light? So I was curious for those kind of questions, right? And I guess, you know, I was, I was interested in physics and chemistry. I remember at biology, all kind of science subjects when I was in school, when I did my uh, leave insert and so on. And then I went on to study theoretical physics in Trinity in Dublin when I, uh, when I went to university. And that gives you kind of a more of a broad range of, of different kinds of physics and mathematics. And after that, then I kind of started to specialize in astrophysics. Um, and again, I wasn't, uh, again, I was quite open as what area I would study, but I moved on then to study um, black holes in the end. So how long exactly have you been doing um, your study in black holes? Oh, that's, that's an unfair question. Um, let me see. Um, so I started in university uh, in 1999. So 20 years, I suppose, at some level. So quite a long time. Um, yeah. But it's a hard subject. So, you know, it takes time. What about black holes do you find, like, the most interesting? Um... Oh, I think that's a, in some ways, an easier question. I think everybody has some interest in black holes, you know. So, like, so for example, there, whatever it was, just over a week ago, we had the first picture of a of a supermassive black hole. Um, so the Event Horizon Telescope took a picture of a black hole in a nearby galaxy, and by taking a picture, it took an image in radio in the radio wave, like that, it was able to see. Like you could never see a black hole, but you could see a, a bright ring and then darkness in the middle. And the darkness is the black hole. And the bright ring that's, um, a, that's revolving around the black hole is what's called the accretion disk. And so, so the, the Event Horizon Telescope took the picture of that. And I think at some level, everybody, well, not everybody in the world, but you know, a fair fraction were genuinely interested in that breakthrough. And it did, you know, it, it was on the front page of the newspapers. And people see it that as being a good news story. And it is a good news story. It's, it's advancing our knowledge of the universe. And for, for like, I think at a human level, like it's fascinating that we can you know, use our telescopes here on Earth um, to look at something that is 55, uh, what is it, 55 million light years away. So that's an incredible distance. And we can take an image of that and start and understand it. So that, that image was pretty much as we predicted it. So our predictions are now getting very close to what we actually observe, which is great. And it's very, very exciting, I suppose. You know, like people are, like to understand the unknown and taking pictures of black holes is really understanding the unknown. Wow. I kind of like black holes for this, this kind of mysterious in the way, the way you can't see them because the light yeah. is escaping and... Absolutely. I think you're, I think that's exactly it. People find them, you know, fascinating objects, uh, really mysterious. You know, they were predicted by Einstein or at least from Einstein's theories and nobody believed it. And not like including Einstein, nobody believed it for the goods of 50 years. And then we were able to see them and now we can, you know, observe them and we're, our predictions are getting better and better. And we're trying to understand how they form. We're trying to understand how they grow. And we also understand now that they are not just these, curiosities but black holes are central in uh, in the formation of galaxies so we need to understand black holes if we want to understand how a galaxy forms so um like and that i suppose brings a new level of importance to black holes that um that we have that they are that central and the other thing of course is you know we've had the ligo detections this detections of gravitational waves so black holes merging together banging together these like what i find incredible about that is that you have two black holes that are you know 30 or 40 times the mass of our own sun crashing together near the speed of light. So this is the most violent, most energetic um, thing that happens in our universe. And we can detect this now. And so that's really you know, a huge breakthrough. And I think more so, I think, than the science, it just shows that humanity is doing something that is, you know, good, 
you know, and like that we are trying to expand our knowledge and that we are using our ability, our curiosity to expand our knowledge. Um, and, and, and I just think fundamentally that is an important thing to do and it's a good thing to do and it's the right thing to do. So just wondering, do you do anything about dark matter or dark energy? Or yes. Like so yes, they are good questions. So dark matter is, <laughs> so if you take the universe and we say like, um, let's say, uh, let me see, think of a good way of explaining this. So we try to understand what's, what makes up the universe, what the universe is made of. Okay, so the likes of me and you, we're like, you know, we have atoms in us and our, you know, our houses and all that. So that, that's 5% roughly of the universe. And then there's another 20%, which is dark matter. And then there's 75%, which is dark energy. So if we go back again, we don't understand what 95% of the universe is. We only understand atoms, which is me and you and everything else. And then the 95% we call dark something, dark matter and dark energy. And that in some ways is the great, it's the great spin that we have managed to convince ourselves that we understand the universe by calling 95% of it dark, which basically means 95% of it we don't understand. Uh, but yes, I do work on dark energy and on dark matter um, because we need to understand both of those, or at least we need to, when we don't know what they are, we do understand what they do. And I know that's kind of confusing, but dark matter is an unknown something that's floating around the universe. And so it, it, it binds galaxies together. Um, if you think of, and you think of a good analogy here, you know when a, a baby sits in a cradle and is asleep when they're very young, the baby is like the galaxy, but the cradle itself that it sits in, that's the dark matter. Because the dark matter glues all galaxies together. So the baby wouldn't be able to sit in anything if there was no cradle there. And so it's the same with a galaxy. You can't get a galaxy without the dark matter. Um, so dark matter is completely fundamental to, to our universe, uh, although we don't understand what it is. And then dark energy is even weirder because, um, so for example, the famous experiment where Newton was, uh, you know, sitting under a tree and he got hit by an apple on his head, that was gravity. Dark energy is the exact opposite. Dark energy is anti-gravity. It pushes things apart. And it's the reason that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. So it's going, everything is moving further and further apart in the universe. Um, and eventually the universe would, you know, just keep growing and everything would be so far apart. Our telescopes wouldn't even, even see anything because they'd be so far away. That's dark energy. Um, so it's pushing everything apart. We have no idea. I mean, like no idea what dark energy is. But yes. But so, so sorry for, that was kind of a, it's a null answer. Basically, we don't know what dark, uh, dark matter or dark energy are, but we just know that they're important and uh, they make up 95% of the universe and to our great shame, we don't know what they are. So just wondering, would dark energy be the reason for the Big Bang? Because if it's pushing everything out, but just, I just thought of that. Yeah, um, so, uh, so the Big Bang is another kind of um, one of these things that we uh, that is a great name, uh, but it masks the fact that we don't know what happened. So the Big Bang was basically the start of time, or time that we understand of it at least. Um, and you're right, the Big, the Big Bang was some sort of an explosion, and it did drive the uh, universe apart. Uh, dark energy is a little bit different though, because it's now while the Big Bang blew everything apart, if without dark energy, it should start to collapse again. And dark energy is stopping it from doing that. Um, so it's a bit like, um, let me see, if you um, throw a bunch of cornflakes up into the sky, they'll eventually start coming back down together again. And so that's like the Big Bang. But the only thing is, for some reason, dark energy took over and it started, the cornflakes started spreading out and out and out and out and out forever. And that's dark energy that has taken over. So if you like, you throwing the cornflakes into the air is the Big Bang. And then for some reason, gravity didn't pull them back down again. Dark energy took over and started pushing them further and further apart. We don't understand that. But it's like a good analogy. So just, I'm not sure if this question makes sense, but which one would you say is stronger, dark matter or dark energy? 
Um, so no, that does make sense. Um, what maybe makes sense is which one is more important. Um, so hmm. So hmm. I think so. At the moment, it, for us at this stage of the universe, okay, we take it the universe has been like the life of a human. So we're gone through the toddler years, and we're kind of at like I would think probably in our twenties in terms of the universe age, okay? And dark matter is definitely the more important one at the moment and has been in the past. As we, you know, we're kind of entering an era now uh, where dark energy becomes more important because it's starting to drive everything, everything further away at greater and greater rates. Um, so in the future, once we hit our 30s and 40s, uh, dark energy will be more important. But at the moment, dark matter is still, still the most important. Do you think like, um, I was just reading something sometime and just if dark energy kept pushing any um, the things out and out and out, do you think eventually that gra um, they might just stop and gravity will take over and put it back in? Um, so that's possible, right? Um, because we don't know exactly what dark energy is. You know, again, and that's why we call it dark. Um, but yeah, no, so it could be that in the future, dark energy becomes less important and then gravity would take over. You're absolutely correct. Um, unfortunately, our basic, I mean, like really basic understanding of dark energy at the moment seems to suggest that that won't happen. But again, because we don't know what dark energy is, it's still a, still a possibility. It could be that dark energy just gives up after a while and stops pushing things apart and that gravity would then start to win again. Absolutely. At the moment, dark energy is, has, has in the last uh, like two billion years or so, started to beat gravity more and more. Um, but again, we don't understand dark energy, so it's possible in the future gravity could win. Absolutely. So why do you think, uh, why do you think black holes are at the center of galaxies and things like that and not this unicross. Yeah, no, so they are. So um, the most massive ones, you're right, sit at the center of, of massive galaxies. Um, so at the center of every big galaxy, we get a massive black hole, okay? Um, but that's not the only black hole in every galaxy there. For example, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, I'm kind of gonna guess here now, I remember, never remember this number, but it's of the order of a million black holes are in the, in the galaxy. So there are lots and lots and lots of them. The tricky thing with black holes is they're black. And so they're really, really hard to see. Um, so they don't give any light. They don't shine. The only way we can detect them is if something is unlucky to be near the black hole and it starts to suck that thing in. And as it's sucking it in, we see the gas or whatever it is shining brightly because it's basically been ripped apart. And that shines very brightly. We, that you know, happens, you know, there's, there's 20 examples of that in our galaxy. So very small number compared to the total number of black holes. And then the other way we can detect black holes is if they hit off each other, so merge together with like LIGO. But again, that's only going to be a tiny fraction. The vast majority of black holes are just black. We'll never see them. They're very hard to detect. And they're just floating around in the, um, in the galaxies. They are just what happens when a big star dies. And we know how many big stars there are. So therefore, we know how many black holes should be there. We have no way of seeing them. They are, they are just, just there. They're harmless because like galaxies are in space. It's ginormous. And black holes are relatively speaking tiny um so it's it's the same chance of i would say the chance of you you know of a black hole wandering into our solar system is the same chance of you playing the lotto every day for the next 100 years and winning every single time so <laughs> unlikely so just do you work on like supermassive black holes and stuff like that or yes so so again yeah, so Back to the Event Horizon Telescope. That took a picture of a supermassive black hole, one in a nearby galaxy. But it also took a picture of one in our own galaxy. Um, but the picture was harder to, to make look nice, and they're still working on that. But so there is these supermassive black holes at the center of all galaxies, let's say. But the trouble is, and it's a tricky question, we don't know how they got there. So what I try to understand is how do the first black holes, how were they born? And when were they born? 
what did they look like? What was their mass? How big were they? And then how did they grow to be the supermassive ones that sit, for example, at the center of our galaxy or the center of other galaxies? So we think that the first black holes, so like if you like the baby black holes, were born when the universe was a baby. So born uh, basically 13 billion years ago. And then it takes them time to grow and grow and grow to be the huge ones that sit now at the center of, of massive galaxies. Um, so it's a complicated problem because well, you need to, first of all, find a way to create black holes in the early universe. And then you need a nice way, like you uh, mentioned earlier on, you need a nice way for them to sit at the center of galaxies. And then you also need a nice way for them to get big. So I kind of, um, so this is good. It's a hard problem, which means that I'll never be out of work, I hope. And there'll be plenty of science to do, plenty of, um, and, and like, it's a really cool time as well to be studying black holes because we have LIGO and because we have the, Event Horizon Telescope, there's a lot of, you know, positive, positive feeling around black holes. We're making huge progress in terms of our observations. We're making huge progress in terms of our theoretical models. So we're making a lot of progress in, in understanding black holes. And, and the great thing is, like, honestly, people are interested in them. You know, people want to understand what a black hole is and why are they so cool? What are these things? And, um, you know, they're fascinated by them. Like, and it's a fascinating story, you know, predicted by Einstein. Um, nobody believed him for hundred or for fifty years, which is even better. He's a genius. It's crazy. And then you know we see them and we're like, okay, yeah, no. So the genius was right. Shock. And um, and then now it's you know a huge field. It's fascinating. Um, just I have a couple of questions. First one: How many different types of black holes are there? And uh, do you think microscopic black holes actually exist? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so let me think. So how many kinds of black holes are there? So in some ways, there's only ever one kind of black hole because they're just these very simple objects that just are essentially, you know, really extreme gravity that are just, you know, sucking in matter. Now, the other question you might say, well, they're defined by their mass. So how big they are. And at the moment, um, we can, there's an observational bias there and that means that we can see the small ones because we can see them with LIGO the gravitational wave detector and we can also see them in our own galaxy simply because they're nearby and if they're shy if they're sucking something in they shine brightly so we see the small ones and by small I mean 10 to 100 times the mass of our own sun and then we see the insanely large ones because they sit at the center of galaxies and they're like you know a billion times the mass of our sun and shining incredibly brightly and so we have these two ends of the spectrum and we don't see the ones in the middle as easily. And there's a few reasons for that. One is, the, well, they may be rarer. That's one possibility. Um, the other thing is, again, unless they're actually eating. So it's like, unless they're eating, we can't see them. And it's, it's the same thing as if some alien race um, came, you know, and was looking at um, the earth and it could only see people if they were eating. That isn't going to be a huge fraction of their day, you know? So it would give this weird kind of like statistics. So if we could only see people while they were eating, it'd be like, okay, well, there's not that many people down there. You'd see them sometimes. And then you'd be like, oh, that's, you know, that's weird. And it's the same with us for when we see black holes, we can only see when they're eating. So it makes things a little bit complicated. Um, but nonetheless, um, our observations are getting better, you know, with, with the gravitation waves, with the event horizon telescope. So we are making progress. And maybe there is, a, maybe it's just that they're all there. The moment we see one end small, one end big, the bits in the middle are really hard. And then your other question was on microscopic black holes. Um, that is possible. Um, so for example, if we go back to your question on dark matter, some people think that dark matter is, is microscopic black holes. Um, so that's one theory for it. Do I think microscopic black holes exist? Um, oh, um, Hard question. Um, we don't have any evidence for it. I think, I think the early universe was a, was a very interesting environment and anything is possible. I wouldn't rule it out, but like I have no reason to believe it. They exist or don't exist. They do, do, um, if they're tiny, if they're tiny, they'll evaporate um, through Hawking radiation. So they have to get big relatively quickly to survive that. Um, 
I probably on balance don't think they exist, but I'm open to the idea that they do. Hope that made sense. Mm. Kinda. Yeah. Just, just pretend. <laughs> so have you got any like projects coming up or events about that like um do you see that people can go to about black holes or anything like that? Yes. So every October we run Space Week. Um, so Space Week is an international event and DCU uh, runs a, a public night of talks every October during Space Week. Um, it's usually in early October, I think. And at that we, because most people in astrophysics in DC work on black holes, generally there's a very strong black hole flavor to our talks. So that will be in October. Um, then other, that's our main, that's kind of our main event every year. Um, and then during science week, we'll do something as well. We tend to do more going to schools to talk to, about, talk to kids about science and black holes and astrophysics. But the main event we have is in space week in October. And that's generally always has a good, strong black hole flavor to it. Um... Well, and tell me, uh, do you want to be an astrophysicist? Oh, um, yeah, definitely. Not definitely, but um, I'm weighing astrophysicist with engineer because they both have really cool, interesting jobs. This is true, and it's very important to do something you're interested in. Uh, I would say that's the best advice I can give anybody who is going to do um, science or any other subject. Do something you're interested in. Do something you love. And so why do you, why are you interested in physics or engineering? What interests you most about them? Well, physics is just a study about and a lot of things that we don't understand, like um, stars and how they form, planets, that sort of thing. And um, engineering, I just love that you can be, um, I love the creative side of it. And I love how um, whatever you build can benefit humanity. And I, yeah. think that's, I think those are just from two really um, good job ideas. I just can't decide which one. <laughs> well, I think you're fortunate. I don't think you need to decide quite yet, which is the good news. Um, but no, absolutely. Uh, both of those things that you said are absolutely true. Physics is, is you're right, it is trying to understand how the world works um, and try to make sense of what the rules are for our, for our world. And exactly like, you know, how do stars form? How do black holes form? Um, you know, how, what's the strongest material we can make? What's the lightest material we can make? How can we make computers go faster? How can we make cars go faster? And there is a huge overlap there with engineering. Absolutely correct. You know, people now building, you know, the largest telescopes in the world. The Event Horizon Telescope was an incredible engineering achievement. They took, they took, they took radio telescopes from across the entire globe to make an effective telescope that was the size of the earth. And that's the only reason that we were able to take that photograph because they basically magicked up a telescope. One, because they took a signal from, you know, some signals were in, taken from the South Pole and some were taken from Europe and some were taken from the States. And they combined them together as a virtual earth-sized telescope, uh, which is an incredible achievement. And same with the um, detection of the gravitational waves, that was another, monumental engineering feat um which is incredible um and again even when they detect you know at cern where they do the particle acceleration they detected a higgs boson another incredible engineering feat so we're in some ways living through a golden age of incredible engineering um technology breakthroughs you know um so it's been really fascinating really exciting time um so both of those subjects i would think are really exciting areas to work in fantastic uh but the important thing is do something you love uh because then you'll be you know motivated you'll be good at it you'll be interested you'll uh jump up on a monday morning you'll be running in uh which is always important so just uh kind of back to the engineering bit just what what thing that has been like recently made in the past maybe few years do you think has like helped astrophysicists the most with like I think probably the gravitational wave detections. So, because that was, I think because there's a huge story behind it as well. So they started trying to build the detectors 25 years ago. So, you know, a quarter of a century and they had to keep improving it and understanding the engineering hurdles that needed to be crossed. 
You know, they needed to get it so sensitive to detect gravitational waves. It was absolutely incredible. Um, because even small things were uh, interfering with their detections. Like if a truck drove down a road uh, nearby, that would, you know, kill their experiment. So they needed to get it incredibly sensitive and they need to be able to filter out all that external noise. Like for example, so they can detect earthquakes across the entire globe. Their, 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 their sensitivity to vibration is so, so incredibly precise. And so I think that was a huge breakthrough. And it's also, I think, a, oh, what's the word for it? It's, it's um, very satisfying, I suppose, that like that level of investment over that amount of time was worth it that they were able to make that breakthrough. And now it's opened up a huge window of opportunity for astrophysics to be able to see black holes and be able to hear black holes merging. Um, so these black holes that we'd never have known about before, no way. And now we see them all over the place. And it's just a huge, good feeling. And it's like, okay, it, it tells us we're on the right track and it tells us that we're, what we're doing is working and that we are making breakthroughs and we're making progress. And in some ways we're making progress rapidly now. So it's been very, very heartening. And, have you, uh, yeah. <laughs> have you like discovered anything recently or? Um, <laughs> I hope so. Um, so yeah, no, we, so our major breakthroughs here in DCU and with international colleagues are trying to understand how black holes in the early universe form. So we found a way to form black holes in the early universe and the results, our theoretical results, um, tell us that it, the, the numbers look correct. So it seems like we found a, a really important way that we can explain where, for example, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way came from, or where the black hole that the Event Horizon Telescope took a picture of. We can explain where they came from. And before, people didn't know that. So we're on the track to, or at least, yeah, like we have, we have an explanation for that. We have a pathway. We have a theoretical model that tells us where those black holes came from. What is, what is, what is your most exciting day at work being? Oh, God. Um, uh, like when you, when you make a big breakthrough, that is, you know, like it's not frequent. Um, this, is not, this is not every Tuesday. This is, you know, a once in every two year or three year event. And you're like, oh, you know, you're like, you're on the right track, you know, maybe. You, you, you put the results together and you say, bingo, it's, it's working. Um, so that's happened maybe two times in three years. And that's, that's like even on the scales I work on, that's incredibly frequent. Um, so um, yeah, when, I, when, when we got big breakthroughs, we, you know, that was a really good day, really, really good day. And, and like in fairness, you know, like, you know, and that is recognized, which is really, really good. And it's very exciting. Wow. Just have you got any like one like discovery or breakthrough that um, you found the most interesting or exciting, fascinating? I like, I think like, so my bit, my work is, is all about finding, is trying to understand where these black holes come from. And so what we found is that, um, so actually it goes back to the dark matter. So if we have dark matter in the early universe and we get big galaxy sized lumps of dark matter and if they crash together, uh, in the early universe, what that can happen is it it can drive the system towards forming black holes. So in some ways, it's not a, you know it's not a one to one connection, but black holes do facilitate the creation of black holes in the very early universe. And I suppose when we found that out, when we found that mechanism that dark matter could be linked to black hole formation, that was very exciting, and that was one of the biggest breakthroughs we've made here um, in DCU, and that was very very exciting. So is, this, is black holes um, the main part of what you study as an astrophysicist or do you study like stars or cloud formation? Most of the work I do is on, is on black holes, trying to understand black holes in the, in the early universe. But I also, um, you're absolutely right, I do try to understand other parts of, um, of, of the universe. So I try to understand also the, the formation of the first stars in the universe. I try to understand how gravitational waves can be produced in the early universe. And I also understand just how the first galaxies can form in the early universe. So most of my work is, is on the early universe and trying to understand the physics of the early universe. Um, but yeah, it's not just black holes. It is also galaxies, stars, um, gravitational waves. Um, then there's, um, there are other more technical things like reionization where the first stars basically start to 
ionize and create a kind of a different, you know, it's, it's, it's a new, new a phase transition for the universe, a new, a, new, a new time for the universe, new epoch. It's like moving from the toddler years to the teenage years, or maybe not. That's quite a big jump, but maybe it's like moving into the teenage years. The um, so reionization is like that time. It's a different time for the universe. I tried to understand how that time happened, what the what the transition was like, and what what, what impact does that have on the universe. Um, so, so there's different things I work on. But it's mostly black holes, but I also work on first stars, galaxies, gravitational waves, things like that. Well, um, <laughs> and what do you find most exciting about the universe? What's your favorite topic about the universe? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I know it's a hard question. There's a lot of things in the universe. Um, I Yes, um, I like like the star formations, like in the clouds and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And black holes, I, I love those as well. Yeah. And mm, supernovas. Supernova are pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you like the most um, energetic events in the universe, maybe the ones that make the most noise. Um, so supernova are definitely right up there. They're you know massive explosions. At the end, like when stars are at the end of their lives, can explode a supernova. Um, absolutely. One of the other, I think, big things that's maybe driving the field forward at the moment is um, our exoplanets. So the discovery of, of the, you know, what people like to say, maybe a second Earth. So, you know, when we'll be able to find something that looks like the Earth in another distant solar system. So that's another area of research that's very active in, in astrophysics at the moment. Um, but yeah, black holes, you're absolutely correct, um, are also, also, they are also and, and have been for a long time, a very, very, you know, hot topic in astrophysics. And I think will be for a long time in the future, just simply because people find them so mysterious and so exciting. Well, um... Well, just, wow, this has been really interesting to talk to you about today. And, um, well, thanks a lot for talking. And, uh, no problem. It's been really interesting. So, um, yeah, bye. Cool. Okay. Thanks for talking, Kira. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>